I'm very, very honored to be able to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, we have been tracking him as a friend of the Grassroot Institute for many years because his work is really the kind of work legally that supports the things that we do. Randy Roth is a law professor at the William S. Richardson School of Law at the UH. He's received the university's highest awards for classroom teaching and community service. He served as president of the Hawaii State Bar Association. You may remember he produced a series of books called The Price of Paradise, which shocked us into realizing how much we pay for paradise. But he's also the co-author of a very, a very famous book, Broken Trust, which chronicles the rise and fall of the former bishop estate. He also served as a consultant to a wonderful movie called The Descendants. I encourage you, uh, if you've not seen it, get a DVD copy or watch it online over the holidays. You'll be charmed to realize that Hawaii is definitely the home for those who may have lived here hundreds of years ago, and it's also the home for those who've come from a far place as well and made it their home. And I think that the movie Descendants helps to uh, affirm that Hawaii is for people of all races and all cultures and all backgrounds from across the world. We are all Hawaiians. And uh, his screenplay won an Academy Award for Best Screenplay, or he consulted on that. In 2000, Randy Roth, uh, the Honolulu Star Bulletin, included him on its list of 100 individuals who made a difference in Hawaii during the 20th century. Some of you, well, actually, I think everybody here was around in the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> so we have an icon today. And I want to say this, just on a personal level. Randy has been an inspiration to me as a model of professionalism, as a model of the combination of academic scholarship with activism. And uh, I saw him from afar when I was involved behind the scenes with the Kamehameha Schools people as an alumnus during the Broken Trust era and admired his work at but since then, I have been deeply appreciative that in light of the fact that many of the faculty at the University of Hawaii, as well as the law school, do not really stand for the preservation of the Constitution, Randy Roth has stood for that. And uh, we welcome him today. We honor him. I hand over this next hour to you, Professor Roth. Please join us. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? I think you'll have to get closer to the mic. How's that? Everybody can hear me? Yeah. All right. I'm, um, I'm an academic, and academics are supposed to give academic presentations, but today I'm not. Today I'm going to just tell a, a story. It's, it's a real story about real people. Uh, I especially like it because it's a local story, one from right here in Hawaii. After I've done that, I'm going to show you kind of a, a movie of sorts. It's an, a 12-minute report on the same story, but as seen through a different lens, as seen by professional journalists uh, from outside Hawaii. And then I'm going to invite you to uh, help me figure out exactly what the moral of this story is, whether there are any lessons that we have, have learned. The story, of course, begins with Princess Pauahi, and as probably all of you know, uh, Princess Pauahi was the last of the Kamehameha line, owned a great deal of real estate at her death, and she placed it in a, in a trust. Uh, it was a charitable trust with five individual trustees. Those of you who aren't familiar with trust law, if you look at her will, the recipients of all her, almost all of her real estate were five individuals, but in trust. So those five individuals actually owned her property, but not to use for their own benefit, but to use for the benefit of people intended to benefit by Princess Pauahi from her trust. The uh, terms of the will are really quite interesting, but the only ones I want to mention in telling my story today is that the mission basically was two schools, one for boys and one for girls, to be known as and called the Kamehameha Schools. 
That's what the princess wanted done with her legacy. One of the last provisions in her will spelled out that as the various individuals that she had named as trustees, as they died or retired or became disabled and could no longer serve as a trustee, that their replacements should be selected by the justices of the Supreme Court. That was the Supreme Court of the Kingdom of Hawaii, and the provision in the will was actually redundant because at that time the Supreme Court had original jurisdiction over probate matters, so even if the will had not said this, the vacancies would have been filled by the justices of the Supreme Court acting in their official capacity. If we fast forward to the 1990s, again, this is a real story, and many of you are quite familiar with at least the the outline of the story. What we find is that according to the Wall Street Journal, Princess Pawahi's legacy has grown tremendously. It is now, according to the Wall Street Journal, the nation's wealthiest charity. They did not arrive at that statement quickly or easily. The financial statements of what was then called the Bishop Estate, this charitable trust that Princess Pawahi had established, the financial statements were notoriously uh, unhelpful in figuring out exactly what it is that was held in trust and what its worth was and a number of other important questions. But the Wall Street Journal had sent out a team of investigative financial reporters who went through everything and said to the best of their knowledge, the charitable trust at that time was worth about $10 billion. To put that into context, at that time, the endowments at Harvard and Yale together were worth less than $10 billion. If you add in Princeton's endowment, it was greater than $10 billion, but not a lot greater than $10 billion. So the Wall Street Journal front page series trumpeted this charitable trust as the nation's wealthiest. Two years later, the New York Times did a story, and on its front page, they described just the land that is not on the balance sheet, just the land that is not there because it's non-income producing land. They described as a feudal empire so vast it could never be assembled in the modern world. According to literature from the Bishop Estate, it includes 63 miles of ocean frontage, and again, it doesn't show up on the financial statements. It is in addition to what today is somewhere in the neighborhood of $9 billion of financial and income-producing assets. Uh, And now, in the 1990s, the judges, the justices of the Supreme Court, now the state Supreme Court, are still selecting trustees but they're doing it unofficially. They can't do it officially because jurisdiction for that has shifted to the probate court. And even an appellate court, the highest court, like the Supreme Court, can't simply take jurisdiction from a lower court. So they aren't able to continue to pick trustees officially, and so they're in the 1990s doing it unofficially. The Oh, by the way, who's Who's deciding this? Well, the justices are deciding it in their official capacity. So acting officially, they've decided that they should continue selecting trustees acting unofficially. (laughs) In the 1990s, you've got this large charitable trust, and there are, by law, a number of watchdogs, people whose official position is such that they have the authority and the responsibility that goes with that authority to hold the trustees accountable, to make sure they're not breaching any of their fiduciary duties. One is the state attorney general. In Hawaii, we're one of just a handful of states where the attorney general is appointed by the governor. And sometimes attorneys general over the history of Hawaii have been accused of of acting politically Uh, Maybe they were acting politically in in this story, maybe not. That's one of the things you can decide. But as of the 1990s, no attorney general had really taken a close look at how the trustees of the Bishop Estate were doing. The probate court in Hawaii has its own jurisdiction, and it can act sua sponte, on its own, 
even if the Attorney General, who has standing to bring issues in front of the probate court, even if the Attorney General doesn't act, the probate court can. And in in an unusual arrangement in Hawaii, the probate court selects a deputy judge, it's called a master, to take a look at Bishop Estate, which some people would say, oh, two, two sets of eyes are better than one. So in addition to the Attorney General, with the responsibility to be monitoring these trustees, you've got the master appointed by the probate judge who has that responsibility as well. Co-trustees always have what lawyers call standing, the ability to get an issue teed up in front of a judge. And there had been, generations ago, lawsuits between Bishop Estate trustees, but at least in the 1990s, that was kind of a a distant uh, memory. And then in theory, you had the IRS out there, and I say in theory because although the IRS has traditionally done a terrific job at the front end in deciding whether to give an organization tax-exempt status, Historically, once it's made that determination, it's pretty much stepped out of the picture so far as the monitoring of whether those trustees are adhering to their fiduciary duties or not. They pretty much just trusted that the state, through its attorney general, its probate court, would be doing that. I had some concerns at the time. Now, you have to understand I'm, I'm in the peanut gallery, which, which means I don't have standing to get into a courtroom. But I'm watching what's going on, and I'm seeing just on the surface of things, without the ability to to investigate, without subpoena power, I'm seeing that there are some obvious breaches of fiduciary duty. Some of them have to do with investment practices or administrative arrangements. For example, the five trustees at that time were bragging that they had what they called the lead trustee system of governance. And if this were an academic talk, I would give you a real long explanation as to just what that's all about. The short of it is, it was an obvious, on its face, serious breach of fiduciary duty. They either didn't know or didn't care because they actually bragged about it. There were conflicts of interest, again, just obvious sitting there on the surface. The organization was notoriously secretive and they certainly weren't about to volunteer anything to me, but because of lawsuits that the trustees had got themselves into outside of Hawaii, by following the news coverage of that, it was really clear. For example, they own land under the Robert Trent Jones Golf Course, this super elite golf course outside of Washington, D.C., and they decided that they wanted to sell that land to the members of that club. Henry Peters was the lead trustee for asset management at the time, so he would normally be the trustee who would negotiate the terms of that sale. But he said, you know what, I'm going to be busy. I'm going to be on the other side of the table negotiating the terms of that transaction on behalf of the buyers. So he, quote, recused himself as though that's an appropriate way to move to the other side of the table, which boggles the mind of any professor of of trust law in any event. And that was right there because he bungled it and got sued by the members, by the people he was representing. There was also a McKenzie oil deal that the trustees had got into, and they put a huge tens of millions of dollars of trust money in, and then on the side, they're investing their own money. That's called co-investing, and you just can't do that. And then there were rumors galore. I knew, for example, that Henry Peters, one of the five trustees, was a member of the Wildlife Country Club. There were rumors that he had been given that membership because the Bishop Estate owned the land underneath the, uh, the golf course. Well, if that's true, how in the world can he be accepting a freebie from somebody that is on the other side of the negotiation table from him, when, and they were renegotiating the terms of their land uh, lease at that particular point in time. I could go on. The point is, at an early date, it was obvious there were serious breaches of trust. Their tax-exempt status was clearly in jeopardy. Again, just on the surface, the Internal Revenue Code says to get and maintain 501c3 tax-exempt status, you have to be 
set up and operated exclusively for charitable purposes. It was really obvious that they weren't pursuing their charitable mission in the minimal level the tax law requires. At the time, for example, this wealthiest charity in the nation was turning down 11 out of 12 applicants to Kamehameha schools, and those are just the native Hawaiian applicants. So in terms of serving the the children of Hawaii, it was far short of what one would logically assume possible, given that it was the wealthiest charity in the nation. You've got private inurement issues just jumping off the pages of the newspaper. The trustees, for example, were paying themselves at this time in the late 1990s, paying themselves $800,000 each, each year. Their credentials, at least the credentials of all of them except Ostender, were such that in the marketplace they would not command anything close to that. They're saying, well, it's, it's a commission. We just get 2% of what we make, and 2% of zero is zero, and so we're earning every cent, single penny. Again, from a trust law professor's standpoint, this is laughable, that an absolute minimum requirement, there are others, you can never, as a trustee, pay yourself more compensation than what your services are reasonably worth. And if any of us in this room were handed $10 billion of assets to work with, I don't think we would generate zero in the way of income against which that 2% would be calculated. Excessive lobbying, they would pull up buses to the legislature in an attempt to lobby various provisions. And involvement in political campaigns, again, rumored. This is before all of the subpoenas, before all of the investigations. It was rumored that they were very much involved in specific campaigns, not just locally, but in Washington, D.C. as well. Now, again, I'm just in the peanut gallery, and this story that I'm telling you, you'll find soon that that I'm kind of in the middle of it. And it would be, I think, perfectly logical for you to say, why would this guy from the peanut gallery try to put himself in the middle of some sort of of story. Well, I teach trusts and estates at the only law school in the state. In fact, I'm the only member of the faculty who teaches trusts and estates at the only law school in the state. And if trusts and estates as a a specialty, if if my training was somehow represented with a shape, it would be this this horizontal line that I've drawn. I also teach nonprofit organizations. Well, Bishop Estate is not only directly in the trust and estates area, I need to talk about it when I teach trust and estates courses, I need to talk about it, I need to understand it, and I need to help other people in Hawaii understand it when I'm teaching nonprofit organizations. I also teach federal taxation. Let me back up. I'm the only person at the only law school in the state that teaches uh, federal taxation. So, you know, you, you look, well, what's at the very center of all of these specialties that I uniquely am teaching? Well, of course, it's Bishop Estate. Now, you may remember I had a, a slide a minute ago showing my various concerns, I left one out. It looked from a distance as though somehow or another trustee selection of Bishop Estate trustees by the justices acting unofficially, that it was somehow influencing judicial selection in a bad way. The word that I used at the time in speaking and writing was it was corrupting the judicial selection process. So remember that drawing where I've got three lines crossing right at at Bishop Estate? There's actually a fourth line because I also teach professional responsibility at the law school and for many years was the only professor of professional responsibility at the only law school. And one of the things we cover in professional responsibility, well, one of them is how lawyers are supposed to behave and The story I'm telling could be subtitled, Lawyers Acting Badly. But also part of this course is to teach judicial ethics. 
and there were some obvious, right on the face of it, judicial ethics issues that needed to be addressed. Also, I happened at that time to be president of the State Bar Association, and I think certain responsibilities come with holding an office like that. So now we've got even more lines crossing, all in the exact same place. Obviously, Bishop of State, we've already seen, is there, but now the Hawaii Supreme Court obviously is in play as well. Well, let's do a, a quick review of the key players in my story. And to figure out who these key players are, let's kind of talk about them in categories. First of all, from a categorical standpoint, who selects Bishop of State trustees? Well, obviously it's the justices of the Hawaii State Supreme Court um, acting unofficially. They acknowledge that it would be absolutely wrong for them to do it officially, so I guess on a figurative basis they're taking off their robes so that they can act unofficially. In other words, when people teach judicial ethics, we, people who teach it, don't normally talk about judges acting officially or unofficially, especially when what they're doing officially they used to do, un what they're doing unofficially they used to do officially, and we only know they're doing it unofficially because officially they told us they were acting unofficially at the time. It's nonsense. So who decides that the trustees will be selected by the Supreme Court justices? Well, again, you know the answer, the justices, Again, as I've just said, acting officially. All right, so how do they get to be justices? These people who select Bishop of State trustees, and I think everybody knows Bishop of State trustees at that time at least were like modern day ali'i, that you just don't step into their shadow, that there's phenomenal remuneration, there's phenomenal power, there's phenomenal prestige, and so obviously being able to select who's going to be a Bishop of State trustee is itself a very, very powerful um, uh, thing that you've got there. So who gets to decide who's going to be a justice of the state Supreme Court? Well, they first have to pass muster. They're selected by the governor off a short list, but you've got to get onto that short list. And in certain administrations, getting onto the short list was where all of the, the politicking was done. The governor would have one person that he wanted on that short list, and it would be the job of certain people on the uh, Judicial Selection Commission to, to get that one name on the short list. So who creates these short lists? Well, I already told you. It's the Judicial Selection Commission, right? So there we know who picks the people who can be named as a justice of the Supreme Court. And like I say, it's not that there's just six names out there and each one has a one in six chance. There are six names out there and at least at certain times, like at this point in time, um, the one name has a one in one chance of being selected. So, let's see. So, who appoints these commission members? Well, actually, there are nine commission members, but seven of them are appointed by the president of the Senate, right? He's got an appointment. The Speaker of the House got one or more appointments. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and the Governor, okay? So the trustees are selected by the justices. The justices indirectly are selected by the commission and members of the commission are selected by the President of the Senate, the Speaker of the House, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and the Governor. So who were Bishop of State trustees in this period of time that I'm now referencing, the 1990s? Well, there was a President of the Senate, and there was a Speaker of the House, and there was a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and there was a Governor's closest confidant who only was there because an all-out attempt to name the governor himself had failed. That's my favorite chapter from the Broken Trust book, Gladys Brandt's telling of the so-called Blue Ribbon Panel's uh, experience. Well, I believe in, in callings. Um, I shared with Kali'i that, that 
earlier in my life after I finished college and was working for a big eight CPA firm, uh, I decided that I had a, a calling uh, to be a Jesuit priest. And I, I entered the Jesuit novitiate and I spent a year living under vows, temporary vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And after about a year, my superiors and I jointly dis- decided that my calling had been a wrong number. <laughs> I, I still think if they would have done away, if they would have given me a waiver on that vow of obedience, I'd still be there, but, <laughs> but they didn't. So at any rate, um, how in the world did I get off on that? <laughs> so, oh, I know, I believe in callings. <laughs> you know, I'm the only professor at the only law school basically teaching the courses that are all relevant here. And so I'm thinking, maybe I've got a special responsibility. In other words, it would be shameful if I didn't do what I could do to help the public understand that there were some real problems here. So um, put together a a group of, of people. And David Shapiro, in his introduction to our Broken Trust book, he said, you know what was in that manifesto, the so-called Broken Trust essay, was very, very powerful, but he said what really gave it its power was the stature of its authors. Actually, he said the stature of four of its authors, and I was the fifth. Um, I had started the ball rolling because, as the professor, I was going to write a piece for the newspaper, and in trying to figure out if the rumors were true or not, I started talking to people, and they would talk to me off the record, nobody would allow me to record it. Some of them wouldn't even allow me to take notes as I was talking to them. But almost everybody I would talk to would give me helpful information and usually suggest other people that I talk to. And I ended up talking to retired Supreme Court justices, retired trustees, um, sitting legislators, sitting judges. Um, any number of, of people who had special insights in, in what's going on here. Um, the five of us put together this, this essay just kind of laying it out, and some of you may recall that in the first paragraph we said the time has come to say no more. We as a community have to put our foot down. And many people think of the Broken Trust essay as having been focused and pointed at uh, the trustees, Uh, Actually, I think it was at least as focused on the judiciary in general and the Supreme Court justices in in particular. Uh, In fact, in talking about the selection of trustee process, uh, we wrote clearly the princess intended a sacred trust, but what we ended up with is a political plum. So what happened uh, after this thing appeared? And just a A real quick side note, we wanted to get it in the advertiser because it was the big newspaper. Uh, I was kind of the the runner for this group of of five co-authors, and so I I tried to meet with Jim Gaddy, who was the editor of the advertiser at the time. I was told that, that it could never run without his approval because it was obviously going to be very controversial. Everybody expected it would result in in lawsuits, that the five of us would would be sued. That was the modem operandi of the trustees to to punish their opponents with uh, lawsuits that became prohibitively expensive. So I understood his hesitancy, but after he canceled appointments with me nine straight times, um, I went down, said I need to see him. They said, no, he's not available. I said, call the police if you want. I'm not leaving until I've met with him. Fortunately, a couple of hours later, he came out. He was angry, but he met with me. It may sound crazy for somebody to go say that, but I had gone back to the four you know, giants that I'm just hanging on to their ankles and saying, well, I can't see him. He's canceled. He's canceled. And they said, you get in there. You figure out a way. Well, I ended up seeing him, but he ended up saying no. Fortunately, the afternoon newspaper, the Star Bulletin, was still alive at that time. It was dying. It's It's circulation was much smaller and it was shrinking. It had been on the market for quite some time. Any buyer had to assume the liability and, hand, and, and the, the, the uh, union contracts 
and, and nobody was bidding anything to take over the Star Bulletin. So it was on its last leg, which I think is one of the reasons why it said, sure, we will publish it. Well, within weeks of that essay coming out in this story, there were five separate investigations going on. A court-appointed fact finder, that was Pat M. A court-appointed master, that was Colbert Matsumoto. The attorney general at that time, Marjorie Braunster, uh, was instructed by the, the governor to investigate. The Campaign Finance Commission, um, uh, which was Bob Watata, uh, had his investigation going. And I was contacted by the IRS and asked where we had gotten the information that we had put into that broken trust essay. I couldn't um, uh, give the identity of, of all of the sources, but I could give enough information that they felt it was credible, so they threw a lot more resources into their, their audit that they had already begun. Of course, the critics were, uh, were criticized. Uh, our, our motives were called in, into question not just by the trustees, which you would expect, but they put pressure on various members of the business community who were publishing their criticism of us, the critics. Uh, one of the Supreme Court justices told my uh, boss at the time that I was flirting with disciplinary proceedings. For non-lawyers, that means I'm looking to get disbarred if I don't watch out what's going on. Who's in charge of deciding what lawyers get disbarred or not? That's the justices of the Supreme <laughs> Court. But there are also death threats. Uh, Lori Ann Childers, who was the head of technology at uh, Kauaha Plaza, the headquarters for the Bishop Estate Trustees, she had been called into work on a weekend and instructed by one of the trustees to, to wipe clean a server. And she said, well, I've read in the newspaper that there are investigations starting up. Is this appropriate? And the trustee said, I told you to wipe it clean. So she did. But then she contacted the attorney's, attorney general and said, I don't know if I did the right thing, the wrong thing, but I want to tell you what happened. She told her story. Within an hour, she had gotten, or her home had gotten, her husband answered the call, an anonymous call threatening her life. She was given an armed guard that would accompany their child on, the, on his way to, to preschool and, and back. After living that way for several weeks, she and her husband sold their home, moved to the mainland, and refused to cooperate in any investigation of the Bishop Estate trustees. As these investigations got rolling with their subpoena power, it soon became clear that these trustees had set a world record for breaches of trust. They were up to their eyeballs in various political campaigns, including congressional candidates from Hawaii, not to mention county and state um, candidates. Uh, consulting fees, retainers, salary, people on the legislature. One of the, re the investigators from the attorney general's office said she thought that at least half of the members of the legislature had some sort of connection making them to some degree beholding on the trustees of the Bishop Estate. Uh, probably you'll recall that Milton Holt, who was um, head, I think, of the Finance Committee at that time, was an employee of Bishop Estate and given a credit card, which it eventually in these investigations became known that he'd used in Las Vegas casinos and local strip clubs. Uh, run up tens of thousands of dollars of, of, of expenses. Oh, by the way, when that came out and there was pressure on the trustees to get Milton to pay that back, they gave him a bonus, which to the penny was equal to what he owed plus the taxes on the bonus. They grossed it up so that he would not be one penny out of pocket in, quote, making good on his inadvertent misuse of this credit card. Um, redirected invoices, there would be people, Marshall Ige was in the Senate at that time, and Marshall ended a campaign uh, in debt, had bills, uh, contacted the, the Bishop Estate trustees, and they said, have that company rewrite the invoice, send it to us as if we were the ones who had benefited from that sale rather than the campaign, and then they paid it. Side deals, um, you know, the, the 
uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on lawyers preparing the paperwork to move the situs of the trust from Hawaii to a Sioux Indian reservation in South Dakota, attempting to get out from under the jurisdiction of the various agencies that were investigating the trustees at that time. Well, now, if I can get it to work, we'll see if we can do the story as told from outside Hawaii. Here we go. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. We'll go directly, directly to the file. You may never have heard of the Bishop Estate, but it's the largest charitable trust in the United States. The source of its enormous wealth, about $10 billion, goes back more than 100 years to the lush hillsides and beaches of Hawaii. It benefits just a small group of people, but its political power and influence reaches beyond Waikiki to Wall Street and into the nation's capital. Until recently, its operations and investments were known only to the people who ran the Bishop Estate and those it did business with. But a series of scandals have changed all that. It's been the biggest story in Hawaii since Pearl Harbor and a window on power and politics in our 50th state. Once upon a time, before Hawaii became a state or even a U.S. territory, before there were hotels on Waikiki Beach or surfers riding the waves, back when Hawaii was an independent kingdom, there was a beloved princess named Bernice Kauai who turned her back on the throne and took the hand and the name of an American adventurer named Charles Bishop. When the princess died in 1884, she left 400,000 acres, nearly 10% of all the land in the Hawaiian Islands, as a gift to the country's children. Her will created a trust for the sole purpose of building a school to educate the island young people. Today, that school commands 600 acres overlooking Honolulu. For years, it was the richest educational institution in the United States with more money than Harvard, or Yale, or Princeton. An elite private academy, kindergarten through 12th grade, for just 3,000 students of native Hawaiian descent. For as prosperous as the Kamehameha School seemed to be, the charitable trust the princess set up to run the school was doing even better. The Bishop Estate was, and is probably, the most powerful single entity in the city. Former Hawaii Attorney General Marjorie Bronster says the Bishop Estate was unlike any charity she'd ever seen. Their tentacles were everywhere in the business dealings, in the legislature, and everywhere. The assets included hundreds of thousands of acres of prime Hawaiian real estate, beachfront hotels, office towers, and shopping centers. It developed a country club outside Washington for the nation's business and political elite. And at one point, it owned 10% of the Wall Street investment house, Goldman Sachs. And that's just scratching the surface. They own a bank in China. They own offshore reinsurance companies. I mean, you name it. They were involved in everything. And all for the benefit of a school with just a few thousand children in Hawaii. But what was supposed to be a tax-exempt charitable trust devoted to education was behaving very much like an international conglomerate. While it was raking in hundreds of millions of dollars every year, the Bishop Estate was spending less than half of that on the school and serving just 6% of the eligible children in Hawaii. They acted as though the trust was there for them, and if there was some sort of trickle-down benefit to others, well, that's okay, but they acted as though it was all there for them. One of the first people to suspect that something was amiss was Randy Rawl, the University of Hawaii, the only professor of trust law in the entire state. He says the five trustees who ran the Bishop Estate were violating their legal duties to carry out the princess's will. What were the duties as trustees? Well, first and foremost, undivided loyalty to the interests of the beneficiaries. No matter what, the interests of the beneficiaries have to come first. That's in children of Hawaii the children of Hawaii. And these trustees just made a, a mockery of that. Roth says people were afraid to do anything because the trustees included some of the most powerful people in Hawaii. A former speaker of the legislature, a former president of the state senate, and a close confidant of a governor, who were all appointed by Supreme Court justices they had helped select. Good job being a trustee. Well, 
if being paid $800,000 a year <coughs> helping to run a charitable organization is a good job, I guess so. Who was it that decided that the trustees deserve that kind of money? Why the trustees, of course. And when we started making noise about it, they increased their salary from $800,000 a year to over a million dollars a year each. They do it because they needed the money or just to kind of thumb their nose at you? I don't know whether they cared about thumbing their noses at me. Um, I think that they felt that they could take it, and then they did. For Henry Peters, being a trustee wasn't even a full-time job. For 10 of his 14 years as a trustee, he was also a member of the Wise House of Representatives and served as its speaker. What about the million dollar salaries? Oh, well, don't you think that's a little greedy? I don't know if you would characterize it as greedy. Uh, 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 have. Yes, we have. Although most charities pay their trustees nothing, Peters makes no apologies for his compensation and says he and the other board members were worth every penny. They pay themselves a percentage of the estate's income. The more the trust took in, the more they took home. It's a commission. It's not a salary. And a commission oh. on what? On income and, and gains. I mean, if you mean zero, the 2% of zero is zero. We receive 2%. Essentially, the trustees operated the Bishop Estate as a huge investment fund with them calling the shots. In her will, which is now carved on the walls of the school chapel, the princess demanded full public disclosure and accountability from her trustees. What is my possession for the But not even the Hawaiian court that oversees charitable trusts could get complete records or get the bishop estate to obey its court orders. In the mid-80s, the court said, we're really concerned that you've accumulated about 50 to $60 million. Spend it. Do they spend it? Not only did they not spend it, but they used it to continue to build their financial empire. And at the same time, they were cutting programs because they didn't have enough money. It's a $10 billion trust. It's the most important private institution in the state. They're ignoring court orders. Everyone's just saying, well, you know, I'm sure it'll all work out. For years, most Hawaiians were willing to overlook all of this. Traditionally, they tend to be non-confrontational and slow to anger. They respect their institutions and consider Princess Kauai, the school, and the Bishop of State a sacred link in their history. But even they finally lost their tempers when trustee Loki Lani Lindsay, a former hula dancer, gym teacher, and school administrator from Maui, decided she was personally going to run the Kamehameha School. She decreed that the kindergarten kids and the first graders had to be able to recognize her and the other trustees, and she wanted that by Christmas of that year. So did the kindergarten kids have to know the names of the, of the trustees? You'd have to laugh, and yet that's just one little example of how she ran this as if she were the empress. The Western Association of Schools and Colleges, which accredits educational institutions, agreed citing an oppressive, intimidating, and fearful professional climate during Lindsay's tenure. I can't change what they perceive me to be, and I can't change the allegations they watched against me. But her behavior didn't inspire many tears among members of the school community. In fact, it provoked a group of students, parents, and alumni of the Kamehameha School to do a very un-Hawaiian thing. They staged a protest march demanding to meet with the trustees. If the trustees had sat up and conferred with them, none of this would have happened. And they could have kept going on their very way, ripping off the trust without the beneficiaries warning about it. For federal court judge Sam King, the march was the last straw. King joined Professor Roth and several other Hawaiian elders with unassailable reputations to co-author a manifesto cataloging the abuses of the Bishop of State. But the Honolulu Advertiser, the state's most important newspaper, declined to publish it. So they took it to the much smaller Honolulu Star Bulletin, which ran it the very next day under the headline, Broken Trust. What happened when the article was published? It was built. <laughs> Within days, Governor Ben Cayetano ordered Attorney General Bronster to begin a full-scale investigation. And the results confirmed everyone's worst suspicions.
not only was the bishop of state the most powerful institution in Hawaii, over the years it became a multi-billion dollar candy store for the state's political establishment. The trustees handed out jobs and contracts to friends and relatives, used the estate's funds for their own personal expenses, and at times pursued investment policies that looked like they were designed to line the trustees' pockets. Take the million dollar investment in KDB Technologies, an internet company that was supposed to provide movie actors' resumes to casting directors, and also offered an internet dating service. Not only was it an unusual investment for a charity, but the deal seemed to carry with it a proviso that the brother-in-law of Bishop Estate Trustee Dickie Wong, a former Hollywood executive, get a six-figure consulting contract. Fellow trustee Lokilani Lindsay told us that the board members were just trying to protect their investment. A trustee said, well, if we're going to do this and it involves the movie industry, then what we need to do is get somebody who knows more about it than us. Don't you think it's curious that they decided to hire a relative of Dickie Wong? No. Nor did the trustees find anything curious about the estate's treatment of Milton Holt, a state senator whom the trustees made their special projects officer. They even gave him his own credit card, which he used from Honolulu to Las Vegas. And it appeared that there was something untoward about some of these expenditures. I think some of them were at uh, Saigon Passion 3. And that would be... <laughs> it was probably best described as a mood bar. When the estate tallied up more than $20,000 of the princess's money spent in strip clubs, casinos, and bars, it asked for repayment, then rewarded Holt with a salary bonus in the exact same amount of improper expenses plus taxes. Henry Peters believes it was just a coincidence. So you're saying the, uh, the bonus you received, the $20,000 in, in expenses, he had to pay back? None whatsoever. Even though it was roughly the same amount? And, and it could be, purely circumstances. On top of it all, when the public finally got a look at a court-ordered audit, it turned out the trustees weren't the financial geniuses they claimed to be. The Bishop Estate had been getting just 2% return on its investments. Right in the middle of a bull market. Right in the middle of a bull yeah. market. How do you explain that? <laughs> they didn't know what to do it <laughs> They argued that they were worth a million dollars each each year because they were functioning as CEOs. Well, if they applied for a job anywhere else as CEO of a large financial institution, they wouldn't get to the door. It would, it would be the, the joke of the office. It's no wonder the Bishop of State hated scrutiny. And as Marjorie Bronster discovered, the trustees had explored some creative ways to avoid it. And one of the things that they did was they tried to figure out whether they could move out of the state of Hawaii. Where did they want to move it? They tried to look at a Sioux Indian reservation um, to try and see whether or not they could avoid not only state oversight, but also oversight by the Internal Revenue Service. Maybe they should have tried. Last year, the Internal Revenue Service had had enough, threatened to end the Bishop of State's tax-exempt status unless the trustees were removed. By year's end, they were gone replaced by an interim board. They literally set a world record of breaches of trust. They could not have done it worse if they had tried to do a poor job. And they don't believe it themselves. That, that, that to me is very upsetting. In fact, Henry Peters told us the only mistake the trustees made was not to buy the Star Bulletin, the newspaper that led to their downfall. They would have bought Star Bulletin. A local newspaper. And at least we'd had a chance to uh, have our side of the story told. But that certainly has not been the case today. That was the one thing you couldn't control. Absolutely. <laughs> right now, there are lots of things that Henry Peters and the other former trustees can't control. The state of Hawaii wants them to personally repay the estate more than $75 million in damages. But some things haven't changed. The Hawaiian State Senate didn't appreciate Attorney General Marjorie Bronster's investigation and refused to confirm a nomination for a second term. Oh, okay. wow. <laughs> well, there you, there you have the story. <laughs> there you have the story as as told outside Hawaii looking this direction. 
Uh, people who weren't here then maybe are wondering, well, how did all of this end, right? It was still going on, if you will, when the 60-minute report came out. Um, well, the IRS was accused by the trustees of, of having overstepped its bounds in forcing the trustees out. The trustees called it a form of, of extortion. When academics get together, they kind of agree that the IRS went beyond what the IRS was supposed to do. I'm glad they did what they did. I think they had to do it. I think the local judiciary was not going to pull the trigger. But quite frankly, the IRS did something that they had never done before and have not done since. And when I talk to senior officials at the IRS, they say it was just a totally unique situation. It was something that couldn't continue. They thought what they did was the right thing to do, but they've not done it to another charity since. The trustees, as you saw, were removed. Once they were removed, the lawsuits started. I mean, you can imagine a trustee who had paid a lot of money to lawyers for years would be saying, hey, if I did something wrong, it must be because I didn't get good legal advice. So the lawsuits started uh, flying. But then all of a sudden, because of a huge insurance policy, kind of an officers and directors kind of policy that the trustees shouldn't have bought but did, was out there and it was used to grease the slicks on uh, what was called a global settlement, the terms of which were confidential, and everything just went away. The trustees didn't have to repay any of what they had wrongfully taken. The Attorney General dropped the $200 million lawsuit against them. The IRS dropped, they were going after $50 million from each of the trustees. Everything just ended. And in explaining why this was put under wraps, it was not public, uh, it was so the community could have closure and healing, maybe, maybe that's not uh, your version of um, the moral of the story. Well, that's, that's, that's the story. And I'm really anxious to hear, and I would just ask you to keep your comments as brief as possible so that we can hear from as many different people as possible. But um, what do you think the moral of this story is? It's a real story. It's here in our home. Is it in the past? Does it say nothing to us going forward? Or is there a moral that has lasting value? And by the way, when everything got swept under a carpet, that's when Judge King and I decided we had to tell this story in a way that would be as permanent as things in this world can get. And so we did the, the Broken Trust book. Uh, as you may or may not know, all royalties from the Broken Trust book go to early childhood education charities here in Hawaii. Judge King and I just wanted to do everything we could in our words and actions to make clear that we didn't do what we did for individual financial gain. So, what do you think? The moral of the story. Let's have a hand for Professor Roth. Thank you very much. Randy, excellent presentation. Thank you. As Randy said, he welcomes your questions, and so would you kindly make your way to the microphone up here and line up, and love to have you ask your questions. The only thing I ask is that, in the interest of time, uh, just ask your question in one sentence or two, and if you want to share something, Randy will be around later on. So let, let us know who you are, Richard, and uh, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Thanks, Randy, for your sharing and for all you've done for us over the many years. <laughs> After all of this global settlement uh, was uh, pronounced, you and I talked about your pursuing other ways to get justice. Were any of those fruitful? Thank you, Richard. Um, no. <laughs> um, in, in a way, the book, I think, is really, really important. And I've run into people who, who didn't read the book because they thought that it was a rehash of, of everything they'd read in the newspapers at the time. Um, I was given uh, by, it was a securitist sort of thing, but it came from the Attorney General's office after Mar Marjorie was gone and, and before Earl Onzai got there, 
and I have 17 banker boxes packed with uh, documents that are, quote, under seal now, if you will, and disk drives with hundreds of in interviews taken under oath by the Attorney General's office. Um, a subsequent Attorney General has threatened to indict me for not giving that back, um, but I have thus far decided not to give it back. Um, the compromise we made, at least tentatively, was that I would keep it under lock and key. But, um, but there, there were a lot of people who were very serious about not having this go any further than it ended up going. Thank you. But you have a question. Doctor, I want to thank you for one thing you didn't mention. Thanks to you, it has been turned over to an election. As a matter of fact, Ken Conklin, myself, and Mike Palsic ran for office of trustee. Well, that was a joke, but it was the first time we could do that. That's the end of my statement. Once again, thanks for the book. And you're my hero, I can tell you right now. But and a quick story. I was quick. I was collecting signatures for the rail, to oppose the rail. Henry Peters comes into the Aurora supermarket and says, hi, hey, what the hell are you doing here? And he says, well, you got something for you to sign. He says, you know, I never understood this, but people will sign anything. Henry Peters signed to fight the rail. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bud. But it didn't work. Thank you. And Andy, you may want to make a clarification. Here. Well, as, as Bud indicated, the, um, the, the justices are no longer involved in, in selecting trustees of, of what is literally the Bishop Estate, but now operates under a trade name, Kamehameha Schools. And there is a process whereby a shortlist is created and the probate judge makes a selection. It's, it's far from perfect, but it's a huge improvement over having the justices make, make those selections. Thank you. Terry Bonsker. Yeah, really. If I heard you right, uh, these, just, these uh, trustees did not have to pay back all that money they plundered from the estate. How was that decided? And, you know, they, I had expected that they would have had to pay back, but apparently they were able to keep all their wealth. How did, they come, how did that come about? Well, I, I don't know. Maybe the moral of this story is that there isn't as much information out there as, as should be out there. Um, this global settlement made everything just kind of go away. And when I say everything kind of go away, there were surcharges that had been imposed. There was a lawsuit that was going to result in huge damages. There were what are called intermediate sanctions that were going to be imposed. There was just a host of things that would have taken back what they had inappropriately taken in the first place, plus huge amounts, and they ended up not having to give back a penny. Thank you. Philip Blackman. Thank you very much. Good story. Um, the question I have is going forward, just using the example of the uh, dead people getting big salaries. Is there anything from what you've learned that could allow that um, improper expenditures to be recaptured in some fashion? Just in one second, Brad. And, and before Professor Roth answers, if you have a gray Mazda 3 license SNT 120, it needs to be moved. Thank you. Yeah, I, I believe in, in individual responsibility, that each of us as a citizen has a responsibility to to pay attention to issues like the one that was, was just mentioned. Uh, and I think if, if we sit back and wait for an organization like Grassroot Institute or a government official or somebody else to, quote, fix things that we think are broken in our, our, our home, uh, I think that's just a, a real, real bad attitude. So I guess what I would suggest is there are a lot of things out there that, that would strike some of us as needing attention. And if each of us takes upon our, ourselves to do what we can, given our own background, given our own interests, given the circumstances of life, etc., if we can all be trying to make our community at least a little bit better, uh, let the trust professors explain trust law, but everybody's got something that they can do to try to put a spotlight on things that need a spotlight on it or um, other ways of dealing with broken things. 
By the way, I've got a bunch of articles I've written up here. If anyone would like a copy of, of any of them, one is called Politics in Hawaii is Something Broken. Um, but there are a number of other articles that you might, uh, you might enjoy reading. And I have some copies of the Broken Trust book that, that are signed by, by Judge King as well as, as myself. And if anybody would like to acquire one for the other way as a gift or whatever, they're $20. Um, but you please help yourself to the articles and, and purchase a book if you would like. Very good. And anyone else who has some questions, feel free to make your way to the line. We have time for a couple more. Mark Toriano. Uh, professor, are there any organized crime connections and issues to the Kamehameha Schools uh, Bishop Estate that you I, I don't know of any connection to anything that would be described as, as organized crime. And there's I, a reporter here, by the way, Randy. I, I, I just, a, a couple of days ago, I, I finished reading Jim Dooley's book, uh, which I highly recommend. And Jim uh, did a lot of reporting at the time and, and did a marvelous job of, of retelling the stories now uh, of a lot of organized crime activities in, in Hawaii during his time as an investigative reporter. I recommend that book to you. Now, I don't know of any organized crime connection, if you will, to the story that I was telling. Thank you. Speaking of Judge King, we have his daughter-in-law, Attorney Adrian King. Thank you very much, Randy. Um, I lived through this story, but mostly in my law office because I was working and not, but I was hearing all this stuff. The lawyers heard all of this stuff before it was printed in the paper. And I knew that the judiciary, it was very interesting because I could sense, and I think the lawyers did and knew that the Supreme Court sensed that it was, they were in trouble. The CJ was in trouble. Because most people in the state, when they go to court, they think, well, the judges are fair. Well, you know, when people make jokes about lawyers, it's like, well, you, you can't tell me about lawyers. I know about lawyers more than anybody. Lawyers know about lawyers. And, okay. Well, no, this is a, I want to make a comment. The fact was that the sniff of the fact that the public would realize that ordinary judges on the bench, because you see, a lot of the district court judges are picked by the Supreme Court judge, and the, the per diems, and that, that needs to be changed. But I will say that as a result of this, and then when Lingle was elected, and then when she appointed Grechtenwald, there was a huge shift. And that, I think, was her greatest contribution, which as it was as a result of broken trust. So the judiciary is not, is, it, that's a huge shift, and that's a positive thing that has happened, thanks to Randy and what my father loved did. Thank you, Adrian. I appreciate that insight. And our last question comes from John, and then Randy will be available, and we have an announcement before he leaves. But John? And I have a brief story to end with. This is a little off topic. Most people aren't aware of it. Since 1950 and 1980, uh, we've had about 150,000 condo or multifamily units built in Honolulu. Total units built on the island today, about 330,000. If my number is right, according to HUD. The issue is, according to industry experts, is that pipes, following all this needs to be addressed. It's not a Hawaii problem, it's a nation problem. And the industry is not addressing this with reserve funds. Sure. And in the 514B laws, consumer rights, oh boy, this needs to be looked at. Okay, thank you. All right. And 